Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Rob Harrell, and he's here to share with us his new novel, Wink. Now, Rob created the Life of Zarf series, the graphic novel Monster on the Hill, and he also writes and draws a long-running daily comic strip, Adam at Home, which appears in more than 140 papers worldwide. He created and drew the internationally syndicated comic strip Big Top until 2007. So let's welcome to the show, Rob Harrell. Hi there. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. You know, what an honor it is to have you here. And my goodness, your book is a page turner. You probably get that from everybody, right? Oh, well, yeah. I've had some people say that the 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 beginning certainly is, is a little intense, but yeah, no, I, I've, I've heard that people uh, can't put it down, which is the ultimate compliment, I think. Oh, most definitely. I know you're getting such high reviews from all different, you know, review sources. So a great book to read, especially during this time when we're kind of looking for that little entertainment to get us kind of over this hump, huh? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a tough time and, and, Fortunately, it's a book about sort of getting through a tough time, so it's sort of perfect, and it's it's a funny read, so hopefully uh, there's some fun in there for people. Well, we can all use a little humor right now. Well, you know, so why don't you share with us the inspiration behind writing this book? Um, well, the inspiration came from, unfortunately, when I was um, 36, I, I found out I had a rare uh, eye cancer. Um, it was the 25th reported case of it, um, and I went. Uh, had some doctors tell me they were going to do some horrible things and I would probably go blind. Um, and then we found what was at the time, uh, experimental, an experimental treatment called proton radiotherapy, which is now in heavy use. But at the time, um, it was kind of a miracle that came out of nowhere and, uh, they were able to save the site in one of my eyes. And, um, and so, but I, while I was going through it, I was doing a daily comic strip. So, uh, the inspiration was really to tell this story uh, and, and sort of express how much I think the humor of doing a comic strip, you know, having to put myself in a funny situation every day, a uh, funny frame of mind really helped me get through it. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I felt like I had some lessons I could impart on how to get through a tough time, I guess, is the, the basic um, um, elevator pitch. Well, do you know, and, and something that I think a lot of people, that's probably why your book is so widely popular right now. It's something a lot of people can resonate with because in one sense or another, we're all going through a really difficult time. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, and I think um, it's just such an uncertain time too. And, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to know how to feel about it. And, uh, and in my book, I even deal with that some where, where it's like, well, how much should I be freaking out? And, uh, you know, at one point, Ross wishes somebody would give him a freak out scale so he would know exactly where on that scale he should fall. Um, so, yeah, it, it definitely fits with the times. Well, we know that Wink is based off your you know very personal story and that you share a lot of yourself within your main character. Tell us a little bit about the story. And, of course, we don't have spoiler alerts here, so we won't get into all of it. But why don't you share okay. a bit about it with us? Okay. Um, you know, it's, I, I said it in middle school. I had just gotten done writing some other middle just grade, middle grade novels. And I thought that's where I could do the most good writing a book like this. So anyway, it's, it's about Ross. He's a typical seventh grader. Uh, he really wants to be able to just fit in or sort of disappear. He likes kind of flying under the radar. Um, so uh, Ross finds out right before his seventh grade year that he has this rare eye cancer. And um you know, it's it's hard enough trying to fit in in, in middle school, uh, but suddenly he becomes the cancer kid, and uh, he he um, has to wear this wide brimmed hat. I had to wear a wide brim hat for a year, indoors and outdoors, twenty four hours a day. Well, except when I was sleeping, um, to keep the sun off his his face. Um, he he has to uh, wear this goopy stuff on his face while he's getting the radiation treatments. He starts losing hair. He starts getting tired and uh, all of this makes him sort of stick out like a sore thumb. Um, so Russ uh, spends a large part of the book sort of learning how to cope with, uh, with being the sick kid. Um, 
but you know, he has a sense of humor about it and he, he draws, he has a character bat pig that he draws these um, sort of ridiculous comics about, but you can see in the comics how he's dealing uh, with the situations he's going through in real life. And then he also gets into music and uh, his radiation tech sort of introduces him to guitar and some new kinds of music that he hasn't listened to before. Um, so without giving any more away, that's that's the basic uh, gist of the book. But you, you get to see how he, he develops a, a support system, you know, from even some of the most unlikely uh, places and and, uh, and from his family and his friends. And, and uh, that's, that's where the book heads, I'll say that. Well, I think it really offers people who are going through a difficult time, you know, ideas of where they can also get unusual resources, you know, because a lot of times people think, gosh, I'm in this alone. What am I going to do? Yeah. And, and um, you know, you have to develop your coping skills when you're going through something really hard like that. And um, and so, yeah, he, he uh, it's interesting. You know, there's a there's a patient who he starts uh talking with and sort of develops a relationship and there's this radiation tech and uh and he his his relationship with his stepmother kind of evolves um there's a bully who who he has to deal with um but ends up sort of uh learning some things i would say and uh yeah like you said he 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 draws from all different areas of life and uh and also from the art and music which which i think are two incredibly powerful coping skills uh that kids can develop yeah isn't that the truth i mean i think we all can learn from that and to kind of dovetail with that you know so when you wrote this book did you have a certain intention that was for a certain age group or is this book for anybody well my intention is for the, anybody who picks it up would enjoy it um you know th- there's a a term you know all ages books and uh when i did my graphic novel uh years ago i found out that usually all ages books means it's a book for kids um but i kind of enjoy i've always enjoyed books that um that are truly all ages that you you know anybody who picks it up would would laugh and uh and feel along with the characters that sort of thing um so that was that was my goal i i didn't really i, I mean i knew i was aiming it um at middle grade middle schoolers just because uh that was the age of the main character but uh, I certainly, you know, hope that it was a, a wider uh, reach than that. Well, I can definitely see this is for all ages because, I mean, I enjoyed the book. And I think it has life lessons in there that no matter where you're at on your walk, I mean, it helps a lot of people. Sure. And, and um, yeah, and I've had responses from people of all ages that have read it, that have, that have really enjoyed it. And um, that's you know, I'm so excited about this book and partially because it's the most personal book I've written, but it's also the first book that I've put out that, um, then in a real way, I just couldn't wait to get it in people's hands. Cause I felt like they're, you know, I, the dream I have is of somebody who really needs it getting in their hands and reading it. Um, and part of that is because I, I read some cancer books when I was diagnosed and, um, it, it, some of, they were great books. I just didn't find one that was sort of warts and all and made me feel a little bit better. You know, I read Lance Armstrong's book. I think it's called, it's gotta be, it's not about the bike. Um, and it's a great book, very inspirational. Uh, but he sort of attacks cancer like a superhuman super athlete and, uh, you know, goes out for a 50 mile bike ride the day after his brain surgery and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I remember, you know, curled up on the couch under a blanket, it just didn't make me feel that much better. I was, and, and so my hopes was that with humor and uh, a good sense of, um, you know, the absurdity of the whole thing that I could show even those, even those dark spots uh, where you get angry or you just get sad or you, or you lose your energy. Um, but hopefully in a way that's still an entertaining read um, and, and makes you want to keep turning the pages. Well, I'm pretty sure the reviews say it all as far as that's concerned on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, you, I'm really happy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got some, um, you know, New York Times had some really lovely things to say about your book and on and on and on, you know. So, but, um, so when you look at the book as a whole, what are some of the things that you want our listeners and readers to take away from your book? Um. I, I hope, uh, especially like with um, 
a kid, uh, you know, the, the kids that are reading it, uh, my hope is that they can develop some skills for empathy, compassion, things like that for somebody who's going through a hard time. Um, you know, I think there's a, a tendency for somebody who is suddenly the cancer kid or has something horrible happen to them. They become sort of other. And um, I, while it, before I wrote this, I, I was trying to figure out what age group to write it for, that sort of thing. Um, a friend of mine, his daughter was diagnosed with cancer. And she and I talked a lot about it and uh, she had some friends just sort of disappear on her. So, um, I, and I don't think it was out of malice. It was just that they didn't know how to handle it. So they didn't handle it. They just went away. Um, so my, my hope is that um, you learn empathy for the person who's going through something really hard. And then also if you're the person who's going through something really hard, there's some lessons on there on, and um, on how to deal with it and, and, uh, and how to keep a sense of humor about it. Maybe um, I, that's one thing I found out is that, you know, have, no matter how dire the situation is, you're, you're, since humor is still intact and, you know, you're still pointing out, uh, as I said, at one point, you know, if you're, if you just got horrible, horrible news and the doctor wait, walks away and has a milk dud stuck to their pants, it's still funny. Um, you know, <laughs> that sure is, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, you still have that, that part of your brain still works and, and maybe you need to exercise it a little bit. So you know, hopefully there's lessons for, for all sides of the equation. Um, people in dire straits and people around people in in a tough situation. Well, they say that there's great healing power in laughter, you know, (laughs) that's something to really pay attention to. And I would agree with that. Yeah, I I agree wholeheartedly. And, and uh, like I said, I was doing a comic strip at the time and um, I, I, something about, you know, I had to sit down and write jokes for uh, circus animals uh, every day. And, uh, there was something about getting inside the head of a snarky poodle or, you know, yeah, I, I did some, my own sort of art humor therapy while I was doing it. And, uh, so I, I, you know, I felt a little guilty about putting my story on the shoulders of a seventh grader, uh, in the book. Um, but I, I was able to give him the tools and the support system and all that. So all of that made me feel a little bit better about doing that to Ross. Well, as you went through your own cancer journey, what are some of the things that you discovered about yourself? Um, boy, that's interesting. Um, you know, I think uh, there was an element of like the unthinkable had happened. Um, and you never know how you're going to respond when the unthinkable happens. Um, I, I've, you know, I had thought beforehand, like, how, how does somebody respond? You know, what do you do in the moments after you get a horrible diagnosis or a loved one dies or something like that? Those moments when you just, your world has come crashing to an end. Um, and uh, what you figure out is that you keep breathing. And at some point you have to get something to eat and um, you have to figure out what to do next. And uh, I guess, I don't know if it's just about me or about people in general, but I I figured out that, that human resilience, um, where you just push up your sleeves and you get down to business. Um, I think that's what I found is like, you find out how you, how you handle pressure. And, um, that was, I mean, it was an awful diagnosis. I, 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 to be honest, I didn't know how long I lived, frankly. And, um, and to, to figure out that, well, you just sort of shove that to the back of your mind and you say, okay, I need to do my research. I need to see this doctor and I need to get a second opinion. And I need to, you know, um, it's pretty amazing that we as people have that ability uh, to do that. And then, you know, I think I shoved some of the emotions to the back too, which I'm not sure that's healthy, but that was part of what writing this book was. I was able to go uh, pull some of that stuff back up. So it wasn't always fun uh, reliving some of those times. But, uh, but I think it was probably healthy for me to write the book as well. Yeah, I can understand. I mean, here you're working, you've got all these things going on at the same time. I mean, did anyone that you were working with know what you were going through? Oh, they did. And, uh, you know, I was doing my comic strip. It was a nationally syndicated comic strip called Big Top. Um, And uh, I, I let, you know, my syndicate and everyone know and um and they actually got the one time that i didn't do the strip was for the two weeks 
following my surgery. Um, and they actually had cartoonists, uh, a bunch of other cartoonists, each fill in for a day on my strip, uh, including Jim Davis, who does Garfield, and um, you know some of my good friends. They all took a day, and uh, that was just incredibly uh, moving to have them do that. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so people yeah. knew, uh, people knew and, you know, and then I lost my hair and I had to wear this dumb looking cowboy hat everywhere I went. And, um, uh, it was pretty obvious at some point that I was going through something. Um, but, uh, the people were incredibly kind to me. And, and that's, I think one of the benefits of, you know, I realized how lucky I was to have gone through it as an adult, uh, when Frank, you know, people know how to handle a tough situation. Um, and, you know, middle grade is a tough enough place to be. Um, but then you throw something like that in there. And I think it's sort of a time bomb almost, or, you know, just mm-hmm. an explosion of awfulness. And, uh, and that was something that was really, um, I was really able to sort of dig my teeth into uh, writing the book. Well, I, I don't think there's ever a good time to have a health crisis and when it happens, it feels like, gosh, this is the worst time it could happen because usually our plates are so booked. We're so, we've got so much going on. So I think it's, you know, doing it from a perspective of, you know, uh, a child, I think is a great way of doing it because it kind of shows that overwhelm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I also, um, I tried to show in the book, um, the, you know, you go through and you think, oh, this is the worst time, but yeah, you just got to keep going and you keep going and you do that. But then there are also times where it just lands on top of you and you can't fight it. And um, there's a scene in the book where it certainly overwhelms Ross. And uh, and that was very much based on a, <laughs> on a real experience I had. Um, you know, you can only hold those dark thoughts and things at bay for so long. And then occasionally they do creep in. So, um I wanted to show all of that and, uh, and I hope I did. And yet again, like I said, I, I, th- I think I got the sense of humor in there, even, even in the darkest moments. Um, uh, cause when you're laying on the floor, uh, you know, there's another little part of your brain that's watching you from above going, you're laying on the floor. What are you doing? Um, so to be able to write it through first person through, through Ross's, um, perspective, uh, gave me a lot, you know, I was able to show all of it, show exactly how it feels. Now, it sounds like it was a cathartic process being able to do that, even though I'm, I'm sure at times it was really difficult. Yeah, it was. And and I will say my, my wife um, probably read the book the slowest of anyone. Um, and she just said that it was, it was rough um, having to read it. And, and not because I think it's a terribly rough book. Everything I'm saying makes it sound very, very heavy. And I think, um, sort of the surprise if you read it is how was how funny it is and how how much fun there is in the book um but but my wife just you know i could not have gotten through my cancer without my wife we'd been married for a year at the time and um and i think it just brought so many things back for her and frankly there were some parts you know there were some times that i don't remember that well especially you know the couple of weeks after my surgery um where i was kind of laid up in bed and uh on a lot of medicine and um you know, she lived that daily and uh, still has that memory. So, um, but she thoroughly enjoyed the book by the time she got through. And, and uh, um, I, I think it was just rougher for her. So, you know, which makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, she sounds like she definitely was your angel, you know, during all this. <laughs> she yeah. was. And that, that was one thing I felt bad that I couldn't give Ross a wife like Amber to get him through it. But, uh, you know, he has his best friend, Abby. Uh, this girl who's a little more eccentric than he is. And uh, yeah, everybody should have a friend like Abby. That's, that's sort of how I feel about her. So is Abby based off your wife? Uh, in part, in part, I would say, uh, you know, she became her own character, but uh, as far as the, the level of support uh, for sure, she's based on her. So what other characters, you know, if there were any that, really you have real life relationships with that ended up in your book? Uh, well, the doctors for sure. Uh, you know, I had some fantastic doctors that I, I, I can, I can never thank enough. So it was nice to be able to write some of them in there. Um, but then I, I did have a radiation tech who I would talk music with pretty much every day when I would go in and, um, 
you know, he didn't start teaching me guitar and that didn't all happen, but, uh, it was such a great thing to have him to go in and joke about. And I'd bring in mixes and he'd bring in mixes to play. Um, Cause you have to lay there for 25 minutes, basically staring at a red X above you, not move your eye, not fall asleep. Uh, so I would bring in these mixes of louder and louder music to keep me awake. Um, but so, so that was real. And, um, you know, I, there were some other patients who I got to talk to. So there's some um, sort of, amalgams is that the right word of uh of people in there yeah uh, for sure yeah. okay <laughs> make it so, so i got that right <laughs> so the guitar thing that's not a, a real life thing for you you didn't pick up guitar and you know you're not you know playing with any major band right now no no uh well i i do play i mean i have a couple of guitars and and i uh, shortly after college i just kind of taught myself how to play some chords and enough that I can open a book and read the tabs and kind of fake my way along. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm not as good at it as, as Russ, uh, Russ takes to it. Uh, but he's also, he also kind of becomes obsessed with it and, you know, but in a kind of a good obsession, I think it's, uh, it's something to take his mind off what he's going through. Well, I think it's important to have these type of outlets, be it music or humor but when we're going through difficult times to really have some type of outlet that brings you joy. Absolutely. And, and I, th- I think you can't stress how important that is. And, um, you know, you just have to, um, distract yourself at times, uh, is really what it is. Um, and, and rather than let, you know, I'm somebody who can tend to obsess over, you know, thoughts and, uh, and it's, it's, imperative to have something that you can pour that into whether it's a sketchbook that you draw in or you know working on your comic strip or um you know even binge watching some tv show or a video game what whatever it may be um and you know it, it, if you're going through something really tough i'm pretty lenient on what i consider healthy coping mechanisms uh yeah i, I think um you got to be pretty easy with yourself and just whatever it is Whatever that may be, if it's a crossword puzzle or, or um, playing solitaire on your phone or um, going for walks, um, you find something that makes you happy and takes your mind off of uh, the current awfulness. <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, we all need those resources to be able to do that. And, you know, thank goodness, you know, Wink is available on Kindle because, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't want to get any packages, you know, so it's. Mm-hmm. It's great sure. that they can just download it and start reading it. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's a, a fun, light read, despite what everything I've just said here. I think um, that's the one aspect that I can't really explain is, is Ross's mindset and how he sort of sees the world. And I think that's where most of the humor comes from. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think anybody struggling, uh, boy, is it a weird time we're in right now. And, uh, and it's you know, something, something to, to help in any way, in any way, I think. Mm-hmm. I know we've covered a lot of the heavy part, but there is a lot of humor, a lot of funny in the book. And you go, gosh, how does that really come together? But you really are such a great writer. You're able to bring that all together so nicely. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, that was probably the toughest part of writing the book was figuring out that, that tone. Um, and I knew I wanted it to be funny. I mean, and part of that is because everything I've written up to this point has been funny. So I just know that that's one of my, um, that's the way I write. Um, but then I, I, I had to figure out how, how funny to make the, you know, there are little cartoons and drawings interspersed here and there throughout the book. Um, and at one point I had a lot more of them and I ended up pairing it way back because I, I didn't want any joke in there that felt forced or didn't feel like it was coming from uh, sort of the, the inner dialogue that, that Ross has developed. Um, so, so that was what I really came down to was anything that didn't feel 100% genuine Ross, I, I took out. So, you know, during this entire process of writing this book, were there a few aha moments for yourself? Uh, you mean as far as my own? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, uh, I, you know, it's it's pretty easy for me now, 14 years later, to say, oh, boy, you really helped me doing the comic strip. And, uh, you know, and I did have my guitar and I'd play my guitar at times. And, and um, 
it, hindsight is pretty easy to say this is what helped me get through and things like that. But I don't, I don't think it was that clearly defined in my head at the time. So writing the book, it was, yeah, I, I, I think I got an education writing the book too, realizing how much that those kind of things helped me. And, you know, there, um, there are plenty of situations where you need, you need help getting through. We just unfortunately lost a dog uh, or I had to say goodbye to a dog. Um, one I'm of so our, sorry. Yeah. And it's, and it's been really, really hard. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and I find myself thinking about so, some of the, you know, exact same things going back to music and uh, I, you know, I have a mix for every mood basically. And um, I've been in this weird sort of late seventies, early eighties punk thing lately. Uh, but I think there's some anger in that music and, and that's, that's helped me out. Uh, so there are things that I keep going back to. So yeah, I, I think uh, writing a book, I definitely had some aha moments in there. Yeah, I can tell because, I mean, I think everyone kind of develops that themselves as they read your book, Wink, you know, especially with everything we're going through right now, it's able, you know, brings up things that maybe we want to process and get rid of or just work through. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I think there's a lot of ways to do it. And, and, uh, you know, guitar and, and drawing bat pigs is, is not the only, the only route, but, uh, you know, hopefully if you, that's uh, a pretty good one though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I can't tell you how much fun I had drawing the bat pig stuff. So, uh, <laughs> if there's sort of these one page throughout the book, there are these one page comics that he draws. It's like bat pig versus the hat and bat pig versus the anger. And, uh, so you very much get to see how he's working through it. So that was really fun. But, you know, I think everybody can find their own thing. And if it's sports or, you know, um, I don't know, there's, there's an infinite number of them out there, but, um, but I think allowing yourself to, to realize that you, you need that, you need that healthy input as well as the, um, whatever it is that you're, you know, day by day dealing with. And uh, right now we are all very much dealing day by day with something. Yeah. Well, gosh, Rob, I mean, I really enjoyed reading your book, Wink. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? Uh, if you go to um, robherald.com, that's my website. You can find out, you know, the most about me there. And I, I believe there are links to my uh, Twitter and Instagram, but I would say my Twitter is um, at Harold Rob. That's what, that's what I'm yeah, at Harold Rob. <laughs> Make sure I had that right. And uh, <laughs> I'm not a big social media guy, but I'm, I'm learning, especially in this time, because uh, mm-hmm. I really do want to get the word out about this book. And I really do want to connect with people who've read the book and uh so it's sort of against my nature but i'm but i'm becoming more of a um a social media person <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> against yeah. your best judgment there right <laughs> right right yeah but i'm making an effort so so please find me if you can out there oh my goodness well rob thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today thank you so much i i can't tell you how much i appreciate it Well, thank you so much, Rob. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your new novel, Wink. Wink is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you'd like to connect with Rob, you can at robherald.com for more information. Our next guest coming up is Alka Josie, and she's here to share with us her new novel, The Henna Artist. You don't want to miss this. We'll be right back after these messages You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special. 
when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our next special guest, Alka Josie, and she's here to share with us her new novel, The Henna Artist. Now, Alka is a graduate of Stanford University and received her MFA from the California College of the Arts. She has worked as an advertising copywriter, a marketing consultant, and an illustrator. Alka was born in India, and her family came to the United States when she was nine years old. So let's welcome to the show, Alka Josie. Thank you so much for having me, Marianne. I'm excited to be here. You know, what an honor it is to have you here. My goodness, I heard, I've heard so much about your book. And congratulations, by the way, because I heard it also made the Reese Witherspoon Book Club. Yes, that was a completely out-of-the-blue phenomenon. I was so shocked when that happened. I was just like, really? Wow, she actually have a, has a copy of the book? She's actually read a copy of the book? I was just flabbergasted. It's been such a wild ride, and I have enjoyed every single moment of it. When my, the book was released, it was March 3rd, and the publisher had high hopes for it. We had scheduled a bunch of bookstore readings. We had, I had this fabulous launch planned with an Indian dancer, a classical dancer who was going to come and dance through some of the scenes that I was going to read out loud. We had 150 people signed up for the launch and everything went by the wayside when the pandemic struck. So I never got a chance to be in front of readers. Well, imagine my surprise when on March 11th, my publisher called and said, Reese Witherspoon is picking this book for the month of May. So I have been busy the entire time of the pandemic. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, here I am. I'm just going to, you know, cry in my soup here <laughs> for the rest of the time <laughs> that the pandemic is going on. But it hasn't turned out to be that way because when you're a Reese book club pick, you have to, you know, work with them and devise some interesting content for the month that your book is going to be featured. And so I have been doing videos and we've been doing cooking demonstrations and, um, you know, I've been putting together essays for them that they've been peppering throughout the month about how you wear Indian saris, um, the kind of jewelry that my mother inherited for her uh, wedding and also pictures of her wearing those pieces. So, uh, yeah, there's been oh, and then all the spices and the fragrances that are involved in the book, which help it help it come to life. So. I've been really, really, really busy, which I had not expected once the pandemic started. I know this pandemic has really, you know, put us all in in a totally different mindset. And it's really difficult for new authors, you know, because there have been so many adjustments and so many changes, and, and especially when we look at all the industries that have been impacted as well. And so I have to really congratulate you because it says a lot about your writing. It says a lot about your book. And I know that Reese Witherspoon's, you know, book club isn't the only, you know, accolade that this book has received. Oh, thank you so much, Marianne. That is such a delight to hear. I never in my 10 year journey of writing this book expected it to reach as many people as it has and to touch their hearts the way that it has. Every single day, 
I hear from readers on social media or through an email that I get from somebody who found me through the hennaartist.com. I hear from them about how this book is changing their lives. And what they're seeing is that the main character, Lakshmi, and all the different women that are represented in the novel, they all have different desires. They all have different dreams. And women are seeing themselves in one or another of the characters. And they are finding the courage to either reinvent their lives the way Lakshmi did or to reimagine a different future for themselves. Some of them are taking up writing for the first time because they know that I didn't take up writing until I was 51 years old. And, hey, I'm not dead. So, you know, <laughs> um, you know, some of them are taking up writing. Some of them are taking up a new career. Um, and some of them are questioning the validity of the choices they have made in their lives and reexamining and seeing if maybe they should make some different choices. Well, I mean, I just, I'm so thrilled for you because I know as a new author, I mean, this is your first book that's been released and you're getting such great acclaim. Mm -hmm. And that's why I keep pushing on that because it really shows women what's possible if you just stretch your boundaries and go, hey, you know what, this might be a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to go for it. Yes. I was doing a virtual book club uh, just the other night. And it was a group of women, some of them were in London, some of them were in uh, Maryland, some of them were in South Carolina, and they were telling me, these are women of all ages, so some of them were in their 20s, and some of them are in their 50s, and they're telling me that even though we have come far in terms of giving women the ability to have a voice and to speak up in all kinds of conversations, there is still so much work to be done. And even the young women were asking me during our virtual book group, they were saying, so, you know, I'm in a work situation. How do I get recognized without coming off as being too aggressive? I want to be assertive, but not pushy. Um, you know, and women have to navigate so many of these things that far more delicately, I think, than men have to. And in the same way that Lakshmi in the henna artist, and this is why we were talking about this in the book group, in the same way that she has to navigate this world in the 1950s in India that wasn't made for her. The rules were not made for a single woman. The rules were not made for a woman who wanted more than she was allowed to dream about. And so uh, a lot of our women today are still struggling with the same issues of how do I fit into this world that is not of my construct, that is a, of somebody else's construct, you know, from centuries ago. And I need to find my place in it. I need to find my voice in it. How do I go about doing that? I wish, Marianne, that there were a template for everybody. I wish there were an easy way to tell women, okay, you just follow these 10 steps and you'll get there. But each woman has to find her own way because I think our trajectory in the corporate world, our trajectory in the larger business world um, has been so uh, thwarted, you know, at various points along the way that we don't have a clear path yet. And it is up to every woman to find her way. But I seriously believe the way that my mother believed that if she couldn't live the life she wanted to, she could make sure that her daughter could. And I can make sure that all of the women in my circle get to realize their dreams because I can pay it forward. What my mother did for me was such an incredible gift. She was an Indian woman in an arranged marriage in 1955 to my father. She was yanked out of college and her father said, you are too old, you're getting to be a spinster. I've got five other uh, daughters behind you that have to get married. We've got to get you married now. He was so worried that she was going to end up a spinster at 18. So uh, they find uh, you know, the partner for her, my dad. My parents get married and within four years, she has three kids. And, you know, that's not unusual because, you know, in the 50s, 60s here in this country, that's exactly what used to happen, right? Yeah. But, 
but my mother, I know that she had postpartum depression after every child and it was not diagnosed back then. I don't think anybody even understood what, what postpartum depression was throughout the world. So, um, so she had a really hard time and she felt very alone and lonely and she was far from her family and far from my husband's family because my father was an engineer and he was getting promoted all the time. So we moved from city to city to city. We had moved five times by the time that I was nine years old and we got ready to come to America. So, you know, she was alone. She was depressed. Uh, she didn't have the wherewithal or the training or the background to say, hey, I matter and I need help and I uh, want somebody to come and help me. And this is in th- these are the ways in which I could be helped. Please help me. My father, I think, was at a loss as to how to help her. So when she did finally regain her footing, when we arrived in the United States, she is looking all around 1967, really a seminal moment in U.S. history. The Vietnam War is raging. Uh, Laugh-in, uh, you know, that crazy show with all of the uh, hippies singing and dancing on TV? <laughs> Laugh-in is a show that's on television. Um, women are said to be burning bras everywhere. Um, Gloria Steinem is making it big with her Playboy article. And so... She is seeing all of these women around her and all of this culture that is so different from anything she has ever known, where women have freedoms that she has never experienced. And she said to herself, ah, I have but one daughter, and I'm going to make sure that she gets to be the kind of girl that can make her own decisions about her life in a way I never got to. Isn't that remarkable, Marianne? You know, for a woman who mm. came from a culture that was so conservative and so repressive and so patriarchal. Your mother was so forward thinking. I mean, how impressive is that? Yes. I think a lot of immigrants feel like they really need to hold on to their cultural upbringing and to inculcate their children with those same morals and cultural traditions that they grew up with. And my mother was just not that person. And thank God she wasn't because I did get to go to college uh, and major in art history, which is really what I loved. I got to go to study in Florence uh, for a year because uh, Stanford had a program in Florence that I could go to. And even though my parents could ill afford to send three children to very expensive private colleges, they made it happen. You know, they took out loan after loan. They just made it happen. And they made sure that each one of us had a chance to live uh, our dreams and our lives. The only thing my mother said to me is, please don't get pregnant before you finish college. And also, please make sure that you are going to have a career that can sustain you because, you know, you're always welcome to come back home, honey, but I want you to be able to sustain yourself financially because the world is an uncertain place and there are no guarantees and you need to, as a woman in particular, need to make sure that you will always be financially uh, sustainable. And so I took all of her words to heart. I mean, I really thought that that was an amazing gift that she gave me, all these lessons, and uh, but without any imposition of a moral code or even a, um, you know, life code that I needed to hang on to. There were no rules that she gave me except don't get pregnant and make sure you have a career that is financially viable. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice at that time, though, as you know, because when you look at it, I mean, during that time, I mean, there was so much that was going on, you know. So, yeah, you know, that, that's perfect advice for a mom to give. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I just, I, I used to think that if a parent died, that somehow they were gone forever. But my mother, 
is with me every single day. We lost her in 2012, about two years after I had started working on the novel, or maybe three years. And I missed her terribly. And because I wrote this novel as a way of reimagining her life, as a way of reimagining her as a woman who could escape the bonds of her upbringing and fashion a new career for herself and emerge in a whole different city and make herself this uh, entrepreneurial woman who was doing amazing things in healing people. I thought, you know, this is a life I can reimagine for my mother, even though she didn't get to live it in reality, in fiction, she's going to be a star. And my mother got to read uh, many passages. I read them aloud to her and she loved the book. She loved the concept and she always encouraged me to keep going. And uh, so I feel her presence every single day. I felt her presence every time I picked up uh, a pen to start writing or at the computer to finish another page. I feel her presence every time I see a ladybug because she loved ladybugs. And I always feel like ladybugs show up in my life when I most need them. Like when I need a word of encouragement, I see a ladybug and I go, oh, hi, mom. Thank you. Thanks for being here. (laughs) I love that. You know, we all have talismans, right? Mm -hmm. We we all have these, these, uh, these little symbols or these icons that we carry around from either our childhood or our parents or you know, something that gives us comfort and ladybugs give me a lot of comfort. (laughs) I absolutely love that. You know, I look at that as well. It's like when I see ladybugs, I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. That's so special. And to have that deep connection with your mother and, and the signs that you receive, I think that that's really empowering. Yeah. Um, Right after mom died, you would not believe I saw ladybugs everywhere. Like every day I would see five or six of them. And I know it's kind of strange, but, and I, I'm not really a, a you know, I, I mean, I'm not like um, a believer in uh, lots of different kinds of things, but spiritually, I think that, that there's a connection there. I think we always have a connection to our loved ones when they leave us physically. I think that they're always with us in some way in our imagination or in our thoughts or memories. And, you know, it's funny, I've never actually dreamed about my mom in all the time that she's been gone because I feel like she's alive in my mind all the time. (laughs) Oh, yeah. You know, and you can feel that connection. And it reminds me of your book too. I mean, there's so much connection that that readers and our listeners, obviously, when they buy, buy the book, they'll feel as well. But there's this deep connection, you know, with women supporting one another in your book. Mm-hmm. Um, in the writing process, and I think the reason it took me 10 years to complete this book, in the writing process, a writer actually has to go pretty deep into their own psyche in order to develop characters that are deep. I didn't realize that at the beginning because I was just learning how to write creatively. But as I went on and as various people helped me, and by the way, Marianne, I think this is a really important point about writing. Writing is not an individual effort. You may come up with the initial idea, but there are tons of people who are going to help you make that book better. There are your professors or any kind of instructor you've ever had, whether it's in an evening class or some kind of an MFA program. There are the students in your classes who are going to give you all kinds of feedback when you workshop your manuscript. Um, There are editors that you work with who are going to read your book for the first time, even though you've been living with it for a long time, and they're going to see things in there that you are not able to see because you're too close to it. And then there's your agent who is also going to give you some kind of feedback if they're a really good agent. They're reading your book also with a keen eye towards women who are going to be reading it and how their, what their takeaway is going to be. So they give you feedback. So all these people gave me amazing feedback over the years. And every single time, characters, 
uh, became more alive in my mind and they became deeper as a result of some criticism or uh, some uh, kind of a comment that I got from a reader. So now I understand what it is to show a reader the depth of emotion so that they feel connected to the characters in the book. You know, I, that is actually a learned process. I don't think it comes naturally. And I think for everyone out there who is writing a piece of fiction, if you want readers to connect with your characters, you will have to go pretty deep into your own life, into your own psyche, into your own uh, feelings about things and, uh, uh, you know, immerse your characters in what you're feeling, and that will come out on the page. And, you know, as a writer, you write about characters who are likable and who are unlikable. So you have to mine different parts of your personality to make that happen. For example, uh, there's a character in the book, uh, there's the husband, right? There's the husband Mm -hmm. of Lakshmi, and I made him a very... Um, unsympathetic character to begin with. The reason she has to leave her marriage is because he is uh, physically abusing her and he is not respecting her. And after two years, she's had enough and she escapes. She deserts that marriage and uh, he has no idea she's even gone, but she deserts the marriage and she goes to another uh, city and reemerges and kind of reinvents herself. But, uh, the, the, in writing the Hari character, the husband character, I really had to go into kind of a dark place. You know, it's, you know, writers have to go into places they don't want to go to. <laughs> so yeah. I had to kind of go into a dark place with him. I had to go to a dark place with Parvati, who is uh, Lakshmi's nemesis and, you know, her biggest client, but also the wife of the man whom Lakshmi is attracted to. So I have to go into some, you know, dark places with these people. And as the characters learn things about themselves throughout the novel, I'm learning things about myself and my perceptions and how I feel about different things in life. So in a strange sort of way, I think that writing a novel is like therapy. You know, it's sort of like, you know, you are you are going so deep into your consciousness that you may as well be your own therapist when you're writing a book. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, and isn't that true? Because I mean, you really bring these parts, you know, of yourself into this book and you have to dive into areas where as you're talking, you, you know, most people don't want to go, but at some point, does it feel like the characters start writing themselves? Yes. In some scenes they do. So here's my process. I often have the idea of a scene in my head, you know, let's say it's two characters talking to one another and uh, one of them is revealing something about herself and the other character is listening or commenting. So I have this idea of a scene. I will go walking or I will go cycling and I will go for, um, you know, like a three to four mile walk or a 10 mile cycle or whatever. And during that time, as long as I'm moving, the scene is moving in my head. And as it's moving, I will imagine one character saying something and then another character, you know, is, is this is where it starts to write itself. The characters start talking to one another. And I go, mm, I don't know if character one should be saying that. I think maybe character two should be a little angrier. And then I will revise the scene in my head. And then they are suddenly talking in a different way, you know, with different emotions. So I'm like a director. And (laughs) I'm telling the actors, you know, more of this and less of that. And then they actually are writing the scene in my head. I have an iPhone with me always, and I will record what I have just imagined on my iPhone. And then when I get home, I transcribe it. And uh, then I start really working on the scene because when I transcribe it, you know, it's going to be kind of rough and maybe there are some parts of the dialogue that I think, "Mm, I don't know, I can probably work on that a little bit more. So then I will keep working on the scene. Now I will leave that scene alone and I will move on to the next scene. But the next day I'm going to go back to the first scene 
and I'm probably going to revise it even more. So in, in any page of the book where you are reading a scene uh, between two people, three people, a group of people, I have probably revised that scene, oh, minimum of 30 times <laughs> because it takes that long to get almost every word the way you want it to be so that it feels right for those characters. Once you get to know your characters, you know that they wouldn't use the word school. They might use the word college. You know, once you get to know your characters, you know that they would be uh, upset in this situation, but very calm in that situation. So I have to keep going back to scenes as I learn more about my characters and revising those scenes so that it fits their current character. Hmm. That is, I love how you have that process because it really is kind of bringing it down to a place where it's, you have this remarkable story that everyone's in love with and it doesn't go the way most people would think. Right. I know. I just, you know, uh, I'm getting this thing from readers. The book is called The Henna Artist and it has a glossary in the front and it has Indian words that I have uh, translated for people. But within the context of the actual story, most readers can figure out what the word actually means because it's only a word here and a word there. It's not like entire passages are written in another language. But what readers tell me is this isn't the book they expected. They thought they were going to read a book, I don't know, about the partition in India in 1947, or they think they're going to read a book about... um, you know, uh, a a woman's uh, struggle, and this is just her life. They didn't realize that there were going to be so many other characters that come into her life and that are molding her life for her or pointing her in different directions. And they are, I think, pleasantly surprised at how easy the book is to read and also how quickly they finish it. I just heard from two or three readers this morning who said, I finished this in one day. I just, I sat down and I couldn't pull myself away from it. And I just read the whole thing in one sitting. So um, (laughs) that is always so lovely to hear because it means that I did my job as a writer. I made it easy for people to delve into a story and to stay with it and to continue it uh, until the finish line. There are many books that I pick up that I don't finish because for one reason or another, I have lost interest. And the writer's hardest job, I think, is to sustain a reader's interest throughout the book. It's just so difficult. Yeah, it's it's so difficult to keep the pacing. The pacing has to be even. It, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it can go up and down a little bit, but it has to be enough of uh, enough tension has been built, enough suspense, enough of a storyline that keeps people moving forward. So how much would you say that your family influenced your book? Hmm. Well, my father uh, was one of the first group of young men after India gained its independence who really listened to the charge of the prime minister and the uh, powers that be who said, young men, go out there, become engineers and become uh, architects and help us build the infrastructure of India. Dad said it was a phenomenal time, that energy that he felt uh, that India had its own nation back after 300 years of British domination, uh, and that Indians finally were able to breathe and say, we are reinventing our whole country in the way that, in the same way that Lakshmi is reinventing her life at the same time. That exuberance came from my dad, you know, and it came from reading different things about India at the time that men like my dad really felt, you know, like, oh, my gosh, we have our country back and we're going to run it now the way we want it. Um, My mom and dad were both born before independence, lived through independence, and then were in India after independence. So from both of them, I got a pretty good idea of what people were thinking and feeling at the time. There are several passages in the book that I borrowed from my parents' lives. For example, uh, there's a section in there about how important it is for a woman to keep her wedding dowry jewelry. Uh, Her gold is really her retirement fund. 
for a woman to receive that wedding jewelry, it doesn't mean it's jewelry that she's going to wear every single day. It's a jewelry she puts away for a rainy day if her husband were to die or leave or something were to happen. And in my mother's case, when the Indochina War happened in the 1960s, the Indian government asked for people to give their gold to the government so that they could finance the war uh, along the border of China and India. And my father just took a bunch of my mother's gold and he gave it to the government. And my mother never forgave him in the same (laughs) way that Lakshmi's mother never forgives uh, her father for giving her gold up for the Quit India movement. So, you know, like things like that, I borrowed that from my parents' lives. Um, My mother's middle name is uh, Latika, and that is the name of the young queen, the Maharani in the book also. Um, my The palace chef, his name is Madhup, and that is my older brother's name. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I put names in the book that are related to my immediate family. Um, I also put in a lot of food in the book, a lot of Indian food, the curries, the spices we use, the oils and the uh, herbs that we use every single day. Those are all in the book, and those are just for my upbringing, right? Because my mother was cooking Indian food. We all love Indian food to this day, and I think it's one of the reasons why my family has always been so healthy. You know, we eat a lot of those kind of spices. My father still to this day, my father's still alive. He's 87. He's going strong. He, you know, he goes to the pool. Uh, be, be, well, before lockdown, he was going to the pool, and he was playing bridge like five times a week. So, um, you know, he's a clever man. And he was a university professor, so, you know, this is keeping his mind sharp. But um, he drinks a glass of warm milk with turmeric and honey in it almost every night. And that is for a good digestion. Uh, Indians believe that turmeric promotes good digestion. And so, you know, that's what he drinks. And it helps him uh, keep his joints flexible and, you know, without pain. So... Yeah, so I think that's a part of my upbringing and my family life that I incorporated in the book. Um, And then I think, you know, Lakshmi looks like my mother. She looks just like my mother. And my mother was born with these really light eyes that she inherited from her grandfather. And I inherited my mother's light eyes. My eyes are kind of a light gray blue. And so my parentage has always been under suspicion, as has my mother's. So I wrote that into the book because Lakshmi's eyes are constantly being commented upon by people who want to know, did she have an English father? Did she have an Anglo-Indian mother? How in the world did she get these light eyes when most Indians have really dark chocolate brown, you know, eyes? And uh, so I, you know, I put that in there because all my life people have said, you're not really Indian, are you? Is one of your parents not Indian? (laughs) Oh my. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, and I always have to say, no, 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 you know, they're both Indians. And uh, I just think, you know, it's all those conquerors that came across the north of India, where I'm from, uh, you know, Alexander the Great and Marco Polo and, you know, Christopher Columbus was also looking for India, don't forget, when he found America, the continent. So, uh, you know, everybody wanted the, the silk, the spices, um, you know, all the fabulous gold, the richness of India. And so there were a lot of conquerors who came through. And I'm sure at some point, one of my ancestors got involved <laughs> with one of them. And so I ended up with blue gray eyes, you know, go figure. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, Mary. I think a lot of people wonder if the fiction in the book is really the reality of the author's life. So I think what you ask is a really good question because I want to make it clear to readers. Sure, there are elements of my life and my parents' lives that are in here, but that doesn't mean that Lakshmi is always my mother or that Hari is always my father um, or that, you know, there's a, a Malik in my life who is, you know, my little wise person who's always getting me out of trouble and obstacles. Um, So I used to wonder the same thing when I was just a reader and not a writer. I used to think, oh, I wonder if this author's life is, is, you know, exactly what they've written about in this book. Oh, my goodness, did they really have that kind of childhood? 
did that really happen to them? And it's great when a reader does think those things because it means that they're really invested in the book, right? They're reading it so closely that they think, oh, maybe this is the author's life. But in reality, it's a little bit of reality and then a lot of embellishment and a lot of fiction. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm glad that you you said that because I think a lot of times people do think that and they kind of have a hard time separating that fiction from reality, especially when it's such a page turning read like the henna artist is. Oh, that is that is really lovely to hear. You know, my dad, (laughs) I was talking to my dad and I said, Dad, I am so sorry. I know people must be thinking that you are just like the abusive husband in the henna artist. You know, just because people assume that this might be my real life and my real father. And dad goes, oh, don't worry about it. You know, people who know me know I'm not that guy. <laughs> and besides, he said, I've never driven a rickshaw in my life. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a, you know, he's like, uh, he's very proud of the fact that he is a retired university professor and that he got a chance to educate a lot of young people about civil engineering and how to build buildings and infrastructure and so on. So, you know, he's very oh proud gosh. of his life. He's, he's not worried. Yeah. I do wish, however, Marianne, that my mother were still alive and she could see now the work that she poured into me to develop me as a uh, self-realized woman. I wish she were here to see me now because now that I'm talking to all of these book groups virtually who are reaching out and saying, Alka, will you join us for a book club discussion about the henna artist? I'm like, sure. You know, and, uh, and Reese Witherspoon uh, and her fabulous people uh, are always working with me on content for different things about the book. I wish she were here now and she could see um, how much it has all come to fruition And that I could just thank her personally. I wish she was actually here physically so I could say, Mom, meet Mary Ann. She's interviewing me right now. Say hello. (laughs) (laughs) My mom had such a sense my mom had such a sense of humor that most probably, like if we were on a Zoom call and I said, Mom, come over here, look at all of these uh, yeah, book club people that I'm talking to right now, she would probably edge me out of the way and sit down in the chair and say, okay, do you want to ask me anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, you know, because this really close and sweet relationship you have with your mother, I'm sure that she had seen even before, you know, this book came into being that you are that independent woman who is making your own, you know, pretty much bra- you know, blazing your own trail in the world and moving forward. And you're inspiring so many other women to do the same for themselves. Oh, yeah, that is such, that is, those are lovely words. And I love um, the fact that, you know, this might actually be inspiring a lot of women. Um, my mother saw in me things that I didn't see in myself. And I think maybe there are are a lot of mothers out there who can see things in their own children that the children can't see in themselves. So I was very shy as a child. I was always trying to hide in the background. And my mother was always pushing me forward saying, honey, you have things to say. You matter. You are beautiful. You are brave. You are smart. You are courageous. You can do all of these things. Don't hide in the background. Come out. Come out from that shell. And, um, you know, as a kid, I was always so embarrassed by her uh, wanting me to go out there. And I thought for a long time she was trying to live through me. I thought, oh, she didn't get to live this life, so now she wants to live it through me. And it wasn't until I was an adult and I had a more adult relationship with my mother that I realized, no, she had always seen something in me that she said, she could bring out. And that's all she ever wanted is for me to realize that I was whole and I was complete and I was fabulous just the way I was, just the way every woman I think is, regardless of where she is in her life, she is complete in and of herself. Mm, I love that. Well, what final thoughts do you want to leave our listeners with, with? What do you want them to take away from this book? I think I want them to take away that there are so many different kinds of women in this world. And as women, we need to support all of them. Whatever choices they make in their lives, 
it's okay. You know, they're okay. You're okay with the choices you're making. Let's support each other. Let's not hurt each other. Let's always be the sister that uh, our sisterhood wants us to be. Let's be encouraging. Let's be supportive. Let's be, um, you know, the the woman that I think my mother would have wanted us all to be, which is to say, I am whole, I am wonderful, and I think you're wonderful, and I think you're whole, and I want you to do the best you can in your life. Oh my gosh, I love that. You're going to make me start crying. (laughs) (laughs) That is just beautiful. Well, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn not just about your book, but all the events that you have going on as well? They can find me on thehennaartist.com. And henna is spelled H-E-N-N-A. And it's a wonderful art, 5,000-year-old art that is still being practiced today all over the world, not just by Indians, but all kinds of different people. So they can find me at thehennaartist.com. They can find me on Instagram, which, by the way, I love. I love Instagram. And they can find me at my handle at the Alka Joshi, or they can find me on Facebook. And that is also Alka Joshi 2019. They can find me there. Oh, and if, and Marianne, if they have a book club and they're reading The Henna Artist and they want me to participate in their discussion, honey, I am there because I got nothing else to do 24 seven right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I have to say on Reese's book club, you know, video that you did with her. I mean, for Mm -hmm. someone that's quarantining inside, you look fabulous. So I just have to say that. (laughs) Well, you know what? I inherited all of that from my mother, my hair, my eyes, my skin. You know, she, 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 she gifted me so many things. Thank you, Marianne. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. You're so welcome. And I say hello to all of your listeners. And I hope you guys have a beautiful day. Well, thank you, Alka. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new novel, The Henna Artist. The Henna Artist is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And of course, you can get it on Kindle. Again, if you like to connect with Alka, you can at thehennaartist.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit MomentsWithMarianne.com for more information.